Welcome to section two, in which we discuss events and the rules for working with probability. Let's get right into it. The last section was a brief introduction to the concept of probability. But in this section, we will gas up the heavy equipment and get excavating. First, we will revisit the axioms of probability we saw in the last section and illustrate the concepts using the familiar tool of Venn diagrams. Then, we will move on to a number of useful probability rules that help us define events and compute probability. I'm sure folks are familiar with the general concept of Venn diagrams. We often use them to compare and contrast two things. Properties that are unique to the two things go in the outside circles, and properties common to those two things go in the overlapping portion. Venn diagrams are useful for visualizing events in probability as well. Here's a significantly less interesting Venn diagram. The colored circles are two events, A and B. The rectangle labeled with the omega represents all of the things that can happen. Omega is called the sample space. It is the exhaustive list of all of the things that can happen. We can use these diagrams to illustrate a number of concepts that are important for understanding events. We discussed the three axioms of probability previously. This is an illustration that shows how two of them work. If we set the area of each of these objects equal to their probability, this means that the rectangle has an area of one. This is because omega, or sample space, has a probability of one. This is the second axiom of probability. Any events we draw inside of the box have to stay inside of the box, and they can't be bigger than that. This also helps us understand the third axiom, which is how probabilities can be added. We see here that events A and B have no overlap. This means they are mutually exclusive, that is, they can't happen at the same time. As a consequence, we can compute the probability of event A or event B happening simply as the sum of their probabilities. Returning to the outcomes of our coin flip, we know that because it's a Bernoulli random variable that there are only two outcomes. Since something has to happen, back to our second axiom, either we get a heads or a tails and nothing else. This means that our two outcomes fill up the sample space. A list of outcomes are called exhaustive when the list contains everything that can happen. We also know that we can't get both a heads and a tails at the same time. This means that the outcomes are mutually exclusive and in our diagram they have no overlap. When a collection of outcomes are mutually exclusive and exhaustive, they are said to form a partition of the sample space. First off, what kind of random variable does a die roll represent and how do you know? It's a discrete random variable because there are a finite number of outcomes. It's not Bernoulli because there are now more than two ways it can shake out. It's not continuous because we can count the number of outcomes there are. For a fair die, much like a fair coin, the outcomes are equiprobable, that is, they have the same probability. Are rolls of a die mutually exclusive? Yes, they are. In one roll of a die, you can't get both a 3 and a 5 at the same time. Does this Venn diagram show an exhaustive listing of events? Yes, the outcomes one through six are the only things that can happen, and there are no blank or empty spaces on the diagram. Do the six outcomes represent a partition? Yes, again. Since the roles are mutually exclusive and they are exhaustive, the roles one through six form a partition. If this is a fair die and the outcomes are equiprobable, what does that mean the probability of rolling a one is? It's 1 over 6, because the sum of the probability of events in a partition is 1, and since they all have the same probability, it must be equally spread among the 6 outcomes. We also know that the probability of rolling a 3 or a 5 is equal to the probability of rolling a 3, plus the probability of rolling a 5, which is equal to 1 third, because we have the probability of two mutually exclusive events. Complements are more than just flattery they can make certain kinds of problems much easier. The complement to A is written A super C, or A complement. It's any event that can occur when A doesn't occur. In a simple case like our coin flip, the complement to heads is tails, because the only thing that can happen in not heads is tails. For a die roll, the complement to rolling a 1 is rolling a 2, 3, 4, 5, or 6. A and A complement form a partition. This is because either A happens or it doesn't. Nothing else can happen. Also, A and not A can't happen at the same time. One handy relationship results here. If you want to know the probability of A not happening, 
you simply have to subtract the probability of A from 1. Events aren't always mutually exclusive, so if we want a general way to be able to add probabilities together, we have to deal with the overlapping area on the Venn diagram, where our platypus playing a keytar lives. Remember that the area of the rectangle labeled omega is equal to 1. The area of the events A and B are then equal to the probability of each event. When these two events overlap, we get a little lens shape in between them. The area of this space is equal to the probability of event A and event B occurring at the same time. The equation at the bottom makes sure that we don't double count that little lens space when we add together probabilities. Let's extend our coin flip example to the flip of two fair coins now. The figure on the left represents the outcomes from flipping our first coin, and the figure on the right represents the outcomes from our second coin. Both coins are fair, and both are Bernoulli random variables. We draw the diagram slightly differently so that we can look at what happens when we combine the two. We're going to muddy up the diagram for a second by overlaying the two. Now we see four distinct regions in here with slightly different colors. This is because in two coin flips, there are four outcomes. By flipping two coins, we've gone from a Bernoulli random variable to a discrete random variable for our outcomes. Looking at the diagram, we get heads heads, tails heads, heads tails, and tails tails. If we wanted to compute the probability of flipping two coins and getting a heads on either one, we can use our general adding rule. We know the probability of a heads on both coins is one half, but now since we can have overlapping events, we have to account for that overlap. The trick is in computing that right-hand quantity. What is the probability of getting a heads on both the first and the second coin? Let's rearrange the diagram a little bit so that the four outcomes that can result from the two coin flips are clear. Here we label the rectangle in the upper left HH because the first and the second coin were both heads. The upper right is TH because the first was tails and the second heads, and so on. We can see how the four flips create a partition of the sample space. For both coins, heads and tails are equiprobable. So that means the width of these rectangles, which comes from the probability of getting heads or tails on the first flip, is equal to 1 half. The height of the rectangles works the same way. We get it from the probability of getting heads or tails on the second flip, and is also equal to 1 half. This means that the area of all four of these outcomes is 1 quarter. Plugging that back into our previous equation, we find that the probability of getting a heads on either coin is 0 0.5 plus 0 0.5 minus 0 0.25 equals 0 0.75. We could solve this using complementation as well. Of the four equiprobable outcomes that are up there, only one doesn't contain at least one heads, the lower right, which is TT. This means that the probability of getting at least one heads is equal to 1 minus the probability of getting no heads, which is the probability of outcome TT. This is 1 minus 1 quarter, or 0 0.75. There is an important hitch here. In order for this to work, the events we're considering have to be independent. The outcome of our first coin flip has no bearing on our second coin flip. If, for example, flipping a head on our first coin made it somehow more likely to get a heads on our second coin, then these flips would not be independent and these equations wouldn't work. In our situation, when you flip the first coin, no matter what it comes up as, the second coin still has a 50-50 shot at coming up heads. Here's a lowdown on independence. If, and only if, events A and B are independent, sometimes written as A perpendicular to B, then the probability of A and B occurring is equal to the product of their individual probabilities. This statement is reversible. If the probability of A and B jointly occurring is equal to the product of their probabilities, then A and B are independent. While we're at it, let's add a couple more important definitions. When we see the probability of A and B written, this is also called the joint probability of A and B. Anytime we talk about a variable without any other condition or information, such as the statements probability of A or probability of B in the equation here, this is referred to as the marginal probability of A or the marginal probability of B. We will illustrate these next. This is an illustration of marginal probability on the Venn diagram. We ask the question, what is the probability of A occurring irrespective of what happens with B? This probability is the area of the red circle. Most of the time when we're talking about the probability of some event, we're just dealing with the simple case of marginal probability. 
Now imagine that we're concerned with the region that belongs in both A and B, so that both things have to happen. Here are a couple of interesting cases. On the left, we have two overlapping events. The probability of A and B happening at the same time is the area of that red lens in the overlap. Notice how it's smaller than the marginal probability of either A or B. On the right, we have total overlap of A and B. There is no way for B to happen if A doesn't happen. The joint probability is then equal to the probability of the smaller of the two events. So in this case, the joint probability is equal to the probability of B. This is important. Remember that any time that you add variables to a joint probability statement, the joint probability can be at largest the probability of the least probable event. Let's look at this another way. If B happens, A is certain to happen. We can rephrase that and say, given that B has occurred, A is certain to occur. This is because there's no part of B outside of A. If B occurs, then A has to as well. The statement we made, given that B has occurred, is a statement of conditional probability. Conditional and joint probability are tightly linked. Conditional probability is extremely useful in statistics. Conditioning adds information. This is because we start with a statement of knowledge, generally saying, given that. In our diagram here, we know that B has already occurred. This means that we only have to look at what happens inside of event B. We go from the diagram on the left to the one on the right. Inside of B are two events, A, which is the part that overlaps with the other circle, and A complement, all of B that is not also an A. The rectangles are the same size for these two figures. Notice how the area for A in red is larger than it was before. The conditional probability of A occurring, given that B has occurred, is larger than the marginal probability of A occurring. We write the conditional probability of A given B has occurred as P of A pipe B. Remember how I said conditional and joint probability are tightly linked? Their definitions are closely related. The first line gives us the means for going between conditional and joint probability of some events. This statement can be shown by the second figure from the last slide. The area of the large rectangle is equal to P of B. The rectangle B is split into two parts. The red part is the area corresponding to where A and B both occur, and the blue area is where A complement and B both occur. This means that the area of that red rectangle represents P of A and B. Dividing that area by the area of rectangle B gives us P of A given B. In the case where events A and B are independent, we know that the probability of A and B is equal to the product of the marginal probabilities. This leads to the probability of B completely dropping out of the formula. The result is that the probability of A given B is equal to the probability of A. Well, what does that mean? It means that conditioning on the occurrence of B does not add any new information. Just as we said in our definition for independence, the probability of A occurring is the same regardless of what happens with B. The law of total probability, also called the total probability theorem, used to play an important role in U.S. Army Corps of Engineers guidance when doing coincident frequency analysis. It's still applied when doing these analyses, but many coincident frequency analyses have been simplified by using newer simulation techniques. Total probability is a way to compute the probability of an event when it might only be measurable piecewise. In this case, we're interested in the probability of event B. It can be computed by looking at how much of B is inside of A and how much of it is outside of A and taking a weighted average of the two. We compute the total probability of B as the probability of B given A times the probability of A plus the probability of B given A complement times the probability of A complement. Next, I'll show an example that illustrates this important formula. I have two bags that each contain 100 marbles. In the first, I have 75 red and 25 blue marbles. In the second, I have 60 red and 40 blue marbles. I choose one of the bags at random with equal probability and then pick a marble from the bag. What is the probability that I choose a red marble? You have a 75% chance of picking a red marble given you select the first bag. You have a 60% chance of selecting a red marble if you pick the second bag. The chance of picking either bag is 0.5. This means that the probability of picking a red marble is a simple average of the two probabilities, with the result being 0.675. The equation extends to any number of subcases that build our example. As long as the A parts form a partition, we can compute P of B from any number of subcases. This is the form that you'll generally see in U.S. Army Corps of Engineers guidance. 
This can also be used to compute the probability of some third event C, which is a function of A and B. Conditional probabilities aren't reversible. That is, P of A given B doesn't equal P of B given A unless the marginal probabilities are equal. In order to reverse the condition, it requires Bayes' theorem. There are a lot of uses for Bayes' theorem. This equation established an entire field of statistics called Bayesian statistics, which is only starting to gain traction in the hydrologic sciences. Let's try an example. Imagine there's a medical test that detects a specific disease. We label a positive test with a plus sign and note the situations where the disease is or is not present with disease or no disease. The sensitivity of the test, which defines the probability of finding the disease when it's present, is P of plus given disease and is equal to 80%. The specificity of the test, which defines the probability of getting a negative result when there is no disease, is P of minus given no disease and is equal to 70%. In order to plug this term into our equation, we're going to need the false positive rate, P of plus given no disease, which is the complement of the specificity and is 30%. The prevalence of the disease, which defines the fraction of the population that has the disease, is P of disease, and it's equal to 5.8%. We will also need the complement to this term, P of no disease, which is 94.2%. First, I'm going to rewrite Bayes' theorem expanding out the denominator using a law of total probability. This will let us put our sensitivity and specificity into the equation correctly. The entire term in the denominator is just taking the marginal probability of getting a positive test, which isn't easily known, and translating it into things we know. It comes from properties of the test and the base rate of the disease. In this format, the math is very straightforward. The numerator is the sensitivity times the prevalence. The denominator is the sum of the sensitivity times the prevalence and the false positive rate times the rate of no disease. What we see is that despite a positive test in this case, the probability of having the disease is still quite small. This is because the overall probability of having a disease in the general population is quite small. Ignoring the small disease prevalence is a phenomenon called the base rate fallacy and is important to be aware of. All right, we got through the heavy machinery of probability. Hopefully after that, you feel more comfortable with working with various kinds of events and computing probability of events described in a number of ways. A number of these tools will be referenced later in this lecture, so if you need to go back and rewatch some of these concepts, it may be worth your time.